The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Australian Retirement Trust, ABN 60905 115 063, AFSL number 228975 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's trusted by over 4,000 advisors and more than 2 million members. With over $200 billion in retirement savings, they have the size and scale to seek out world-class investment opportunities that others may miss and are committed to working with advisors to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include super savings and Q Super FUM and members at June 2022. Hello and welcome back to this series on the art of building trusted relationships. Now as trust is an unconscious feeling which is felt by somebody and building trust is complicated, looking at the research in this episode, number two of a four-part series, we hear from our panel of speakers about the second area of trust, authenticity. Let's jump straight in. Andrew, thank you for joining me in this, the second episode of our series. We are highlighting the ideas around authenticity and what, how that brings uh, to the trusted relationship of financial advisors. Um, let's kick off with the concept of authenticity. What is it and, and where did it come from? So authenticity is really a reaction to um, a bunch of work which was done and started in 1992 by the Bain Consulting Group, which looked at um, the concept of likability in relationships. And so they were focusing on um, building likability scores for their businesses so that people could understand them and articulate them. And that came out as um, the Net Promoter Score, um, so the NPS score, and which is a likability score. So likability is interesting, but it's not important. Um so, um, likability tends to ha- answer a question in a couple of ways. Would you recommend, um, and, and how much do you like the service of the two questions? And the reaction to that came out really relatively swiftly from, um, um, I think it started in the medical industry where it said, well, that's interesting, but it's not important. What's important in this is authenticity, which is a subset of predictability, which is one of the big trust drivers. So if you think about trust being driven by, Benevolence, competence, integrity, and predictability. Like uh, authenticity fits into that predict- predictability bucket. And if you want to read about that, there's a guy from the University of Michigan who's done some really, really good work on that. And Philip Symbio is another writer who's done a lot of really good work on that. So understanding that becomes really important. So authenticity is two questions. It's are people what they say they are and do they do what they say they're going to do? So it's a really, really simple uh, set of questions to ask. And researchers tend to like it because it gives you a two by two. You can put, uh, you can track people on the X axis on are they who they say they are and the Y axis and who they say that are they going to be, what, uh, do they do what they say they're going to do? So that gives you a couple of quadrants. And it's an, interestingly, we've had some changes in core data in the last little while and I've been pushing the changes through as quickly as I've had. One of the things that you always do is reflect on yourself and uh, am I doing everything that I said I was going to do? And, um, the answer to that was often no. And it was the question, it was never a question of intention. It was a question problem of bandwidth. So one of the things that I've started to do, particularly with clients and, and also with, um, uh, with staff is just promise less. So we'll get to that when we can. And uh, I think you just walked in on a meeting, um, uh, as we were starting Fraser and people were saying, we want to do this, this and this and this. And I was like, not in the next 270 days or not, because we won't be able to deliver it. And that will lower the authenticity we have as a management team. So for in the advice relationships, this becomes really important. And it really comes really important to another part of psychology, which is the concept of anchoring. We're kind of poor at this as an industry. And anchoring is when you come back to something that when that you've done with people and 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 remind them of what's going on. So 
Now what happens in Core Data and, and with our clients is we work in a 90-day cycle with people and we're very clear about it. And we say, this 90 days, we're going to do this and we're going to focus on doing – it's always generally about three things because there's a very strong rule of three in people and the way in which people remember things. So I'm going through the process now. I'm coming back to the team and my clients and said, hey, remember in this quarter we said we were going to do A, B, and C? We've done A, B, and C. Um, uh, we've also in some cases done E, F, and G as well. And if you work here internally and you've done EFNG as well, you tend to get a bonus. And if you've done A, B, and C well, then you know that you get your salary. And if you haven't done A, B, and C, then that's another challenge. And we're having the same conversation with the clients and making sure that we've delivered against the things that we say that we're going to deliver against. That anchoring has a really powerful and positive impact, particularly if you back it up with data. And if you're saying to your clients, we're going to meet in 90 days, in that 90 days, we're going to, we're going to have done these three jobs. And you come back and say, remember how... We said we we're going to do these jobs. We delivered against these jobs in this time frame, and then we have actually do it, and and we can anchor it. So, um, an example at Core Data might be is that we we changed from the Google suite to the Microsoft suite. We said that was going to take a quarter, and we we were going to add, we, we were going to move from Confluence to Share to SharePoint as a way of doing it, and we delivered against all those things. And so, you know, we were able to say we said we we're going to deliver this on the operational side. We said we we're going to hit these numbers on the sales side. We're going to, and we're going to do this on the satisfaction side. Um, six months ago, we said we were going to organize an offsite in Manila. We're now delivering on the offsite in Manila and making sure that we're, we're doing all those things. So this authenticity piece becomes really important. So it's two integers and you should put this in your business all the time. Do, uh, if we ask the question to our clients, are we who we say we are? Uh, do the clients up for a start know who we say we are? That's a really interesting question because often they don't know who you say you are. Um, can they answer the question if you say, you know, company A, who are we? And they can replay back who, who you say you are to them. And B, do we deliver on what we're going to deliver on? Say we're going to deliver on and, and, and have that as an issue. That becomes really powerful. That's in our client feedback surveys now. And sometimes that's really brutal. Yeah. But it's a good learning every time. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into a bit more in, uh, in the next episode into delivery, uh, and reliability in that, in that sense. Um, which is the, which was what comes next after delivery. Um, but I want to talk about, um, a lot of, uh, you, look, you know, we're in, we're in a profession that there has been uh, a lot of human beings and sometimes, um, there's, there's, People being who they're not, you know, like be who you say you're going to be. And, and then if somebody is not necessarily a particular way or they like to uh, do things a certain way, do you think they're better off just to be really who they are rather than try and be someone they're not? As in if, if, if they're not used to, you know, we're, we're recording this in Sydney, there's a lot of suits and ties, but if somebody's in the outback in, uh, in a small country town, they might not be, you know, they're, they're better off to be who they are. It's a, I'm not a trained psychologist, so I'm kind of hesitating to answer this. I've read a lot about this, but yep. I'm by no means an expert and wouldn't represent myself uh, as um uh, as that. If you're not who you say you are, then it causes a great deal of psychic pain. Yeah, it's the whole concept of psychopathy, psychopathy of people who are really good at misrepresenting themselves. There is as many of those people in this industry, the industry they work in, that there are in any industry. So I don't think we're perversely overrepresented in that space. But there are plenty of observable psychopaths in this industry who aren't who they say they are. And if you've been around long enough, you can recognize them pretty quickly. They are by their nature destructive. And you and I will have seen great businesses wrecked by people who were just making sure that they were wealthy at the end of the process rather than had the interest of the business or the customers in mind. Yeah. Those people are fairly frightening because they're prepared to put the pain of other people aside and get wealthy from it and fully understanding what they're doing is going to be causing pain um again i think you need people who know more about psychology than me to answer that honestly but it is kind of interesting yeah i was bringing that when i'm talking to people about podcasts because people are like oh we we edit all this bit out doing i'm said no no we don't we leave the ums and ahs in because that is who you are and if somebody's meeting you in a in a meeting or real life and they've heard of you speaking on podcasts, you're going to get the same person that they, they've seen. So uh, I always talk about the, the the concept of authenticity when people think they're, they're going to edit out all the ums and ahs out of it and, and polish their performance up to make it very yeah, special. It's so, it's so confronting though, Fraser. A few years ago, I was doing some extra education because I thought, I mean, work was really not that demanding and I thought that that would be interesting. And, and so I went and I spent some time at, at at the University of Sydney and I went through a bunch of personal um, psychological tests and I kind of believe in those things. I think they're about 80% right. I was really confronted by the answers about who I was as a person 
and coming to terms with the fact that that um, you know I have very low tolerance for people. I, I move on pretty quickly. I'm, I've got a fast process of brain. Yada yada yada. And all the in some ways the positive parts of yourself, but in a lot of ways that's a negative part of yourself as well because you know increasingly running a business is a role of leadership and increasingly leadership is having a vision but putting your ego aside and if you're quite a competitive person you know you tend to be male you play a lot of sport and you compete a lot of sport you get confused as to why other people aren't competing or trying or striving or trying to do the best thing for the team and um you just have to learn that you have to really focus on the team first and put the other part about it and it's painful um and if you're not hardwired to be a great manager it's absolutely painful but it's the most important job you can do yeah so yeah i'm authentically quite a poor manager <laughs> fair enough and i love the idea of putting your ego aside uh thank you so much for chatting to us about this particular topic we'll jump we'll catch up you very shortly um, when we start talking about reliability no problem at all. jane welcome back and thank you for joining me again we're here to talk about authenticity hi fraser thank you for having me so jane We've had uh, a, a few sneak peeks into your uh, your authentic your authentic self uh, in the last episode. You mentioned some some things about your, your kids and and some of the conversations you have with your clients. How important is it for you to present uh, as your true self? Uh, you know, as as Jane, rather than sort of you know as as a professional that doesn't doesn't you know sh- show their emotion or talk about their kids or anything like that. How important is it for you and your client relationships? Look, it's really important. Um, I was really blessed um, when I had my youngest daughter, uh, who's now 11. Um, I was blessed in a way. Some people might think that it was torture, but I was blessed in a way that um, I could could have a tra- an easy transition back into work. And I sort of went back a little earlier than anticipated for, for a couple of reasons. And um, so I sort of, I had this new little baby that was about three months old and had to do a little road trip um, to see some new clients. And uh, and so they got to see the real me with this little baby. Hello, this is Jane. This is who I am. Here's my daughter, Ruby. She's a baby. And at most of those appointments, it was a week-long road trip around regional Australia or regional New South Wales. And I think every one of the clients was holding Ruby at some point while I was w- writing notes. And, and, you know, I still have some clients who say, how's our baby going? And I say, well, she's now 11 years old. So they've been able to see the real me, the, the me as a mum and um, and juggling me as a planner at the same time. So I think that you know, they have seen warts and all the real me. Um, and there is a thing about um, people in, in regional communities um you know I, I live in a smallish community and there is a real village there's a real village village um and community sense and i get that in all of the places that i go to so people get to you know we've been through droughts and we've been through floods and and lots of different events in some of these in some of these towns so you know i get to see the clients warts and all when they're in very challenging situations and I think they can see that I'm responding in my true, authentic way um, when we're dealing with those situations because there has certainly been some challenging points where clients have gone through where we've had to, you know, take a drastic turn on our pathway of advice. And, you know, I sort of say to the clients, when I'm guiding them through whatever the, you know, the most recent hurdle is, if it is a hurdle, um, that I'm going to remove the emotion from the conversation. I'm going to remove the emotion in what I think is best for them because often they're trying to make that decision with emotion and that can be good and bad. So that's where I explain to the clients that they might be having something very difficult that they're dealing with and that is bringing their emotions to the surface. And, And whilst I take that on board, sometimes I need to put that aside for them in order to make the advice decision uh, for them in their best interests. And I think explaining that makes them see that I have the capability of um, deep-seated emotion, but I also have the ability as someone who's a professional advisor for them to remove it in order to 
take the next step forward. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. A couple of really good things that you mentioned in there, they're just the vulnerability when the clients have a vulnerable moment or that, and often the reason they need you is because they're vulnerable and to be able to present themselves as vulnerable, but for you to be able to be authentically you and be yourself and for them to feel comfortable uh, in that space. Um, but you mentioned the concept of um, emotional decisions, which is obviously, uh, you know, where a lot of the stuff falls down, right? If you just make emotional financial decisions, you probably make more bad ones than good. But if you, if you bring the logical conversation, then you'll probably make more uh, you know, better financial decisions than emotional. So I think it, it, it's interesting about to, to lean into that concept of being able to say, you know, when at emotional vulnerable moments, you're going to bring the logic. Absolutely, because logic is a really important tool to have. And I think when people are feeling very vulnerable and we've all been there, you know, we all have these moments of vulnerability. I think that's um, a very important emotion to capture and to hold on to and to remember what it's like to feel vulnerable because I've you know had instances in my life where I have felt very vulnerable and you know I I have this sort of saying then when I don't know what to do I'll just do nothing because I don't want to go and make a bad decision and if where I'm sitting I'm aware of what's around me and, and the space that I'm in then I won't make a I won't make a move forward because I don't want to make a move backwards until I have all the facts. So it really is about you know explaining to people that it's really important to have as much information as around you as possible and to act um, accordingly when you have as much information because then you can make a well informed decision and. There's lots of people that come to me that are, that are not in a vulnerable space, that we're just moving forward through life and they've just decided that they want to make a decision or I've got existing clients that we're just doing our pathway through. Um, but even then, if we, if we are, you know, doing a review and we're really not making any changes, it's, I'm explaining to them because I've considered every factor and, um, and there's no need to make a change and that's because we've looked at everything around us and, and we've got as much information to make that well-informed decision. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, Jane, thanks for coming and chatting to us about uh, authenticity and sharing a little bit about your journey and your story. Uh, and I love the vulnerability piece and the logical logical versus emotional decisions. Uh, thank you for that. We'll um, join you. We'll, we'll have you back on the next episode when we start talking about reliability. Thanks, Fraser. Talk soon. Uh, now, in this particular episode, we are leaning into the concept of authenticity with regards to building trust or pillar two of building trust, authenticity. Uh, and we've talked about behaviors in the first episode and, and setting up a lot of the conversations and, and clients. But tell us around, tell us about the concept of authenticity to you. You mentioned that you, um, you know, you do like to be real and, and, and yourselves and, and uh, you know, in those meetings. So tell us about uh, how, how important it is for you. And I guess I probably covered some of those in the first sort of episode, but um, I guess the main thing for us is explaining to the client a couple of things. One is what our philosophy is and how we operate to make sure that it is compatible with the types of sort of things they're looking to achieve. I think the, the fee conversation, we sort of spoke a fair bit about that in the first episode. Um, I think that's that's quite important. Um, as far as that's concerned, talking about you know, really just going through the process to, in, in some degree um, with the client is really, really important um, so that we can sort of demonstrate to them that this is what their expectations are, this is what we expect from them, this is what they can expect from us um, and that you know, it, is, it is a relationship-driven type of event and um, you know, so that we, we need to get on and, and make sure that you know, we are compatible as far as that's concerned. Yeah, it's interesting, that, isn't it, the relationship piece of this? So tell us a little bit more about that, how um, how you have conversations or, or you just uh, at the very beginning try and set the scene for this is who I am, this is how I behave, this is how I talk, this is the way I the way I act, um, you know, all those sort of things and, and, and also making the clients feel comfortable about them being themselves as well, not having to put on a, a front. Yeah, and it could just be, I mean, when you've got a target market, for example, that might be, you know, uh, mums and dads or all those sorts of things. It may be, you know, not turning up with a, a suit and three-piece suit and a tie and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and um, we, we still go and visit a lot of clients. Um, that's sort of a point of difference for us. Um, and visiting someone 
you know, I got taught a long time ago, you know, there's nothing like visiting someone in their home because you get to see how they live, how they operate. Um, you know, particularly people who might have children, they appreciate it. I believe, you know, for those of us who've had children, we all appreciate the, the difficulties when they're sort of two, three, four and five sort of thing, trying to feed them and entertain them and those sorts of things. Um, so we're still, and we, we do a lot of work in, in sort of corporates. Um, so we go out to a lot of work workers, uh, work offices and those sorts of things as well. Um, but I think importantly is when someone has particularly been referred um, by someone else, we sometimes have a bit of a conversation about, um, you know, well, you know, what have they, what, what, you know, what did they say to you that sort of more or had brought you in here today? Um, so what was it that resonated with you? And it could be, um, oh, I just want to check on, you know, my super fund or I want to check on whether we're on track for retirement because I know that you've done this, this and this for you know, this other client. So um, having sort of trying to weave in a little bit without saying, hey, you know, do you know the other person's situation? Just trying a bit of background. Um, again, it also sort of shows that, you know, you are listening to what they want rather than, you know, telling them how much we know, so to speak. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, tell you know, the concept of authenticity, when I think about this is what you're saying is it's just building and building and building upon that, you know, that relationship. Um, tell us a little bit more around the, the, those conversations that you have with your client at the initial stages and um, I guess with setting expectations, but tell us about the, that conversation that you have and, and, and throughout your process, how long is your process and how does that work? I'm um, to be honest, I try and have the meeting as quick as possible. Um, we surveyed some clients years ago and the number one issue or when we have clients had any complaints at all was the meetings went too long. I think we have this expectation, whether it be because we're trying to justify our fees or whatever it might be, that we need to have like the first meeting's got to be an hour or it's got to be this or it's got to be that. I mean, we often say to the client before you come in, we need you to send us a high level macro financial picture because we want to spend the time with you talking about the things that are important, not how many BHP shares you've got or what your house is worth, so to speak. Also too, if, if people don't do that before they come in, it just gives us a bit of an idea about a, their commitment perhaps to the process um, and we're getting closer to the point where we probably, you know, not seen as we won't see someone until they've done that because, um, you know, we want to make sure that the time we spend with them is, is of value to them. We'd like to leave them, worst case scenario, I'd like to leave them leaving the office even if we don't do anything for them thinking, hey, that was well worth the 30 minutes or 40 minutes. So often find, you know, normally the, the conversation in the first meeting, I think you can – Unless someone's got a very complex situation, um, we're more interested in what they want to do and at what they want to achieve, and that doesn't really take a lot of time. Um, it's all that data gathering, which can come later, that you know tends to take a bit of time. So we try and remove that as much as we can from that initial meeting. Yeah, that's interesting. I, lo- I love the fact that you asked your clients to do a survey and, and they told you make the meeting shorter. Um, how important is it to you um, that you get the you know the real Anthony Jones across? You know who you are, what you believe in, rather than say the the, the Templeton's um, financial you know advisor from from a from a logo. How, how important is it to you to get the, the real you across? Well, it's sort of difficult because um, I think we we run the same sort of process. We do the same sort of, and I know with my business partner, he he operates exactly the same. So whether a client saw myself or or him, I think you would get a very similar outcome. And I think, look, as long as we always put the client's interest first, that's that will automatically, in my view, place you in that sort of authentic position. Um, you know, I sort of, I guess probably they tend not to talk too much about ourselves, but I'm happy to use examples of myself as well to clients um, to make it a little bit more real. A simple thing could be, you know, if when someone's talking about life insurance, I just, I can handle my, I take my life insurance schedule of my own with me. So if someone goes, oh, you know, we're talking about this and oh, why would you need that? And I, or gee, that seems like a lot or whatever it might be, I'm more than happy to sort of share what I do for myself. It's pretty simple that way. It's a fairly common question, isn't it? What do, what do you do? Well, actually, I'd never get asked it. I'm surprised that people don't ask more often, what do you do? You know, how do you invest your money? Where's your super fund? Where's this? You never get asked. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, they're probably, they're probably just thinking it and too scared to ask. Probably, yeah. But I, I actually offer and say, well, this is what I've got and this is how I've structured and this is the reason for it. So, again, rather than saying something like, um, oh, the reason you have life insurance, maybe life insurance in super is because of X, Y, and Z, 
um, I'll say to them, this is the reason I've done it. Or if you're talking about estate planning, this is the reason I've put a testamentary trust in, blah, blah, blah. Um, so when you've sort of done it, all of a sudden someone goes, well, gee, if you've done it for yourself, you know, you're, you're eating your own cooking, I guess, is the, is the, is the way to describe that. So. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not just do what I say, but it's do what I do. I love it. Uh, Anthony, thanks so much for coming on this particular episode. I look forward to catching you in the next episode. Sure. Look forward to it. Thank you for joining me again, Anne. Fraser, I'm back. You've had me back. I'm a lucky girl. You I'm are. a lucky girl. I've been invited back. You passed the first episode. Yeah, yay. So we'll yay. Get you back. yay me. <laughs> um, now, speaking of which, we are talking about authenticity and yes. being real and being honest and open. And, and it's it's certainly um, uh, from both a – it's probably easy to do as a human being point of view. But I want to talk to you a little bit about from a brand point of view as well because you, we're all human beings but we all also represent brands. And how do we keep it real or keep – remain authentic from both a human being point of view and a brand point of view? It's a really good question. I think uh, I'm so excited about the new brand. Uh, when we're recording this, we showed the the big debut of the, the TV ad with Artie the Pig and Big Baby and the Swedish Trains. Um, so the culture of uh, both Heritage Sun and Q, obviously we've come out of Queensland and Queensland is a really relaxed, informal, fun you know, culturally, um, slightly patriotic, state. I uh, slightly patriotic. I do <laughs> yes. confess, I'm very patriotic as a Queenslander, particularly on those three nights of the year that yep. involve a maroon jersey. But so I guess, and there's a lot of fun, um, and so I feel like the brand, the new brand, has a lot of um, reflects those attributes. It's unpretentious. It's fun. It's accessible. And I'd like to think that is the authenticity of who, you know, everyone I work with here at um, Australian Retirement Trust. That's kind of what it's like to work here. It's down to earth, accessible, fun. How can we help? You know, that's the that's the vibe of the place. Yep, and I think it's pretty important for financial advisors running their own practices that they understand what their own authentic self is and then how they translate that into their own brand. I couldn't agree more. I the advisors who I love have such they have they are so comfortable in their own skin. They're completely unpretentious. They've got a beautiful down to earth bedside manner. If you think about the doctor, like the the doctors that you've, you've been in hospital or had to go to a GP, they don't speak the jargon. They're not sort of all kind of stiff and acting all kind of you know um, professional. Like I'm you know born to rule. Sort of I'm a, you know they say oh don't call me doctor, call me blah blah. Mm-hmm. And the advisors that I think have the highest impact. Um, we've had a couple of advisors over the years sort of talk to all of the staff here at Australian Retirement Trust and the ones that have that are really just their unpretentious normal selves who just tell great – and they're great storytellers and they just tell great stories about how they've helped their clients who happen to be members of art. Man, that people will talk about them for ages afterwards about, oh, they they were just amazing. I loved that story about how they helped the so-and-so member. I'm like, yeah. So that's what it's all about really. You want – if they can – those advisors that do tell those stories – they get repeated over and over. It's the best form of um, advertising you can have. Yeah, when you tell the story of the doctor, it makes me feel like the power and balance, right? The uh, the idea of you know somebody who is on a different level than you. Mm. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? With the advisors just trying to make sure that they are on the same level as the client. And I, but I think there are those. Um, if I apply the doctor, you've got those doctors that refuse to work in the public health system because of this. You know, you know, I'm here to make a lot of money and there is probably that power imbalance where I think like the advisors, um, again, that I think uh, who inspire me, we all obviously want to make a good living, but they have that sense of service where they do some pro bono and keep it, keep it, you know, how can they help and serve the community and also generate a good income for their family and pay their staff good wages, etc. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there isn't that power. They're just they're not that that um, the, the how they how they show up doesn't um, ooze um, power. Yeah, you mentioned that sense of purpose or sense of community. Um, how important is it to understand your own sense of purpose, their own values and philosophies, and therefore be able to say this is actually who I am as a human being, and I'm going to lean in and embrace that? They'll probably end up with those types of clients. Yeah, I, well, I don't you think Fraser that if you walked out onto the street here and you asked. For anyone, what matters most, they'll talk about their family, their health, and financial security. And yet, this industry is the least trusted, and it's probably the least trusted because of people wearing 
um, you know, they've got the Wall Street types, the, you know, the, this very kind of uh, um, doesn't have the accessibility of the ordinary person wandering around their local shopping centre. And so I think if we can bring just the, the, the accessibility factor into everyone's lives through um, through using technology to um, access more people. I know there's a lot of advisors are doing podcasts now and doing their own videos for education. That's the exciting stuff that will generate trust. It will get shared on social media, create trust and realise that these advisors aren't just to sort of there to help the really well-off people, but they're there to help the the people who are just ordinary, you know, they get retired with a couple of hundred thousand dollars, and they um, want to make the most of it. And you, and as an advisor, you can charge a, a good fee for that, um, just like a like an, a normal specialist would. And 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 people and people will talk. My experience will be is that the advisors that do that generate a lot of um, referrals off the back of that business model. Yep, I used to work with somebody who used to talk about the concept of middle aged white men in suits. Um, we've we've seen plenty of them on TV telling mm. uh, telling fibs every now and again. So. It's 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 not just uh, for financial advisors. It's also different uh, people as well. But talk talk to me about the idea of transparency and how um, you know being completely open and honest about um, you know from a business point of view as well as a human being point of view. But you, uh, so I think um, surely now we as an industry, superannuation, financial advice, insurance, we've all worked out that if we try and get too tricky, you're gonna get caught out. You will get caught out. And so I think we must construct everything, the business model around the client um, or the member if you're in super fun world. And if you're trying to um, find tricky ways to generate revenue or inevitably, I just think that that will be exposed at some point because transparency is so high these days and will continue to be so, more so. And then you're risking your brand. You only get one shot, you, um, one shot. In terms of holding on to your trust, and if you if you let go of it, it's so hard to get it back. Yeah. And I think yeah, if you're not prepared, if you if you wouldn't want to put it on the front page of a newspaper, how you how you're running your business model and how you're generating income, then that probably tells you something. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And I think we're also all human beings too. We all make mistakes. So what what are your thoughts about this leaning into when you do make mistakes to be that's, able to own them? Uh, yeah, I think that's what creates trust, doesn't it? You just go, yep, we've stuffed up. We're sorry, our bad. It happened for this reason. You know, we had a we had an error here recently with a technology glitch, um, and it impacted 150 members. It was um, it really just a system glitch. It was embarrassing. We owned it. Yeah, and I think you actually the um, the advisor in question who was very uh, good about it um, really I think appreciated the fact we just owned up and went, yep, it's system stuff up. We're sorry. What what else can we do? <laughs> the, the, and yeah, everyone's human, right? No one's perfect. No systems are perfect. Own it, I say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no, there's no. But we're certainly used to uh, leaning into our own mistakes here at uh, XY. We we make plenty of them. Don't you worry. Uh, yeah, well, it's, you only learn through the mistakes, though, too, don't you? And um, and I think anyone that sort of puts any organisation advisor super fund that puts on a facade of um, yeah everything's perfect and we've got everything nailed. Intuitively, that can't be right. So I think owning what you're doing well, what you need to work on, um, and being open about it creates trust. Yes, absolutely. Well said. Uh, and thank you so much for joining in us in this particular episode where we talked about uh, authenticity. I look forward to chatting you to chatting with you in the next episode when we start talking about reliability. And I know you are a very reliable man, Fraser Jack, so let's do that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>